You're listening to a presentation of The Rising. We're a real church for real people where you can belong before you believe. We're always honored to hear how God is working in your life through this ministry. If you have a story you'd like to share with us, hit us up at wearetherising.com or on Facebook or Instagram. Finally, if you'd like to invest in what God's doing through this church, you can always give online through our site. Thanks again for tuning in and get ready. Lean forward with an expectant attitude to hear a message from God's Word. Here, I, I want to conduct a little experiment before we get started, though. How many of you, uh, if you've experienced no stress in the past two months, clap. Okay, that's some of you. Uh, if you've experienced mild stress, a little bit of stress in the past two months, clap. Okay. If you've experienced a lot of stress in the past two months, uh, overwhelming stress, just so much stress, you're like, I don't know if I can keep doing this, would you clap? That's, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Hey, and here we are in 2020, and this was the year everything was going to change for us, right? This was the year when we were going to get free. This was the year we were going to get organized. This was the year we were walking out on 2019, walking into a brand new future. 2020 was going to be our year. But after our little experiment, here's what we found, that we're still stressed out, freaked out, frazzled, and overwhelmed. How many of you the past two months has looked the same as 2019? Not, not much has changed for many of us, and we said it would. But I got... I got good news for you. And the good news is actually 2,000 years old. It's a promise that Jesus spoke in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Jesus gave us a promise 2,000 years ago. He said, if you'll come to me, if you'll follow me, then I'll lead you to light-free living. And how many of us long for that? I mean, that's what we desire. That's what we want. That's why in the beginning of 2020, we made some resolutions. That, that's why we said some things are going to change. But according to studies, 92% of those resolutions fizzled by February. And here we are, waiting an, another 11 months to pass by so that we can give it a shot again next year. And that's why we're in this series called Holy Shift, because what we've said is that we've tried to make a shift in our life before. We've had sick and tired moments. We've had, that's it, I'm, I'm done with this, everything is changing kind of moments. And then we give it our best try, we give it our, our best effort, and then our motivation falters. Our, our inspiration fades, and we end up going right back to where we were. And so in this series, Holy Shift, I'm glad we did it in February because we failed on our New Year's resolutions in January. This month, though, we get to pick them back up and come up with a plan to actually see something change in our lives. And, and what we found throughout this series is that if we're really going to see a Holy Shift take place, then we have to follow this formula. We, we've come across this seven-step formula for us to see a holy shift take place. And throughout this series, we've been really practical because I can, I can inspire you, I can motivate you, I can give you a great vision and give you some dreams to dream, but until we get uh, practical with it and we start doing the work required to see change, then we won't see a change. And so we, we found this formula that'll help us see a holy shift in our life. We said this, we're gonna have it up on the screen. I wanna invite you to take a picture of it, uh, write it down, and make sure to, to print it out, make a copy of it, put it wherever you're going to see it on a daily basis. Put it by your refrigerator, put it at your bathroom mirror, put it at your, at your bed, wherever it is you're going to see it. But this is a formula we got to follow if we're going to see a holy shift. We said first what we got to do is we got to identify the goal. So whatever shift we want to make in our life, in whatever area, we got to say, what do I want? Here's the goal that I have. Here's what I've, I'm longing to do. And then next we got to list the benefits where we say, what's in it for me? And you got to do this, because when your motivation fades, when your inspiration drains, uh, you got to look at the benefits. If I do this, if I actually achieve this, I'll be a better mom. I'll feel better about myself. I'll be faster. I'll be stronger. I'll, I'll have freedom. I'll have margin. Whatever the benefits are for you, you got to write them down so that you can look at them when times get difficult and you just want to quit on whatever the changes that you want to see in your life. you got to write down the benefits. Next, you got to list the obstacles to overcome. So you say, what's holding me back? 
Why haven't I done this in the past? What, what fear is there? What, what obstacles could come my way? And i got to identify those so that I can be prepared for them when they come. Uh, what's holding me back? Number four, list the skills and knowledge required. As I'm going to see this shift take place in my life, what do I need to learn? What, what skills do I need to develop? And then number five, identify the people and groups to work with. Who do I need? Who can I learn from? Who can I bring alongside me to hold me accountable? Who can cheer me on? Who can help me out? When I feel like quitting, who can say don't give up? Who, who do I need? Number six, develop a plan of action. By the way, number five, that's why it's so important to be involved in a church. That's why it's so important to get connected and get to know some people. Not just show up on a Sunday. If you just show up on a Sunday, hey, I'm glad you're here. But I want you to take the next step to create the community the church is called to be. Get to know some people. Hey, we got a lot of people who would love to get to know you, and they'll make that first step, but you also got to make the first step as well. You can't come to a church and say, well, I didn't know anybody. Did you reach out to anybody? Did you talk to anybody? Did you? Anyway, identify the people and groups to work with. We're here for you. We love you. Number six, develop a plan of action. What do I need to do? So if I'm going to make this happen, I need some action steps. What are the steps I need to take to make this happen? And then finally, number seven, set a deadline for achievement. When? Will I finish? It can't be someday. One day I'm going to write a book. One day I'm going to get fit. One day. No. Make one day. Put a date on one day. When is that going to happen? Is it going to be three months from now, six months from now, five years from now? Set a deadline. When will I finish? And, and, and what happens for so many of us is we stay stuck in life because we stop at the, the first part. We set a goal. We said, this is the change I want to see. This is what I want to see happen in my life. But we don't follow through with the formula. And so if we're going to see a holy shift, we got to take it through all seven steps. And throughout this series, we've been, we've been talking through several areas of our life. And we have these different areas on the graphic here. Uh, we said if we could see a holy shift in these areas and we could live in a healthy way in these areas, then it'll lead us to live the life we long to live. And so we, we, we've talked about having a, a spiritual holy shift, a, a physical holy shift, an intellectual holy shift, and a family holy shift. Today we're going to talk about social, career, and financial, and we're going to wrap up this series. So let's get right into relationships. We want to have a holy shift when it comes to our relationships, when it comes to our interaction with people. Now, now, last month in January, we lived in this series called Instimacy, and uh, this was a series where we talked about how to have real friendships in an Instagram world, and so if you missed it, you can go back and listen to it on the podcast, check it out as good content, I know because I wrote it, so uh, go back and listen to that, but, but real quick, I just want to share something that I didn't get a chance to share in, in that series uh, right here in this point. If we're going to see a holy shift relationally, here's some things we got to do. First, let's set a foundation with Proverbs 13.20. Proverbs 13, 20 says this, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. I love the, the correlation in these two sentences here. It says, if you walk with the wise, you'll become wise. When you walk with wise people, you'll become like them. But then it said, associate with fools and you'll get in trouble. It, it doesn't say, and this is a pushback some of us give, well, if I hang out with bad people, it doesn't mean I'm going to be a bad person. If I hang out with fools, it doesn't mean I'm going to be a fool. You're right. If you hang out with fools, it doesn't mean you'll become a fool. You could still be wise, but you'll suffer the harm of fools. What this proverb says essentially is this. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Whoever you hang out with, that's who you'll become. You want to increase uh, your level of relationships? You want to increase the level of your life? Hang out with people who are steps ahead of you, and you'll become like them. So how do we, how do we uh, have a holy shift in our relationships. I just want to give you two ways that I didn't get a chance to go through in the intimacy series. The, 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 the first one is this. you got to live out God's word for you. If you're going to see a holy shift in your relationships, live out God's word for you. And, and that seems simple, but, but so many of us rarely do this. Uh, th there was a time I was asking my wife, I said, I said, hey, we should get you to preach a sermon one day. And uh, she said, nope, never going to do that. She said, I'll design stuff. She's our designer. She designs a lot of the stuff that you see. And so if, if you think our church looks good, it's because she makes it look good. But, yeah. But she said, um, she said, if I preach a sermon, it would be so short and so simple. I would just get up on stage and tell everybody, read the Bible and do what it says. That's it. That's it. I mean, I could just say that right now. Read the Bible, do what it says, and you'll see a shift in your life. But I want to I wanna dig down a little more because she's a, she's a woman of few words. I, I talk a lot, so I'm going to just expand on this 
a little more. Live out God's word for you. I want to I wanna show you how you'll see a shift in your relationships if you'll do this. Watch this. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I had before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a scary last sentence right there. Anybody living like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the reason why that's so scary is, is not because I'm afraid that, okay, if I live like this, uh, I won't get to be with God forever in eternity. We, we know God's grace uh, covers us and God's forgiveness uh, covers us. But, but when he talks about anyone living like this will not inherit the kingdom of God, what we need to understand is that the kingdom of God is not just something in heaven, something that we fly off to one day, but the kingdom of God is also here and now. Like God has set aside a life for you to live. And it's a life you long to live. It's a life that you desire to live. It's a life you want to live. And it's a life in his kingdom. It's a heaven kind of life. And what the author is saying is, hey, when you live like this, when you're saying, God, I'm going to follow my own way instead of your way, you're going to miss out on that kingdom life. And you're going to wonder, why do I feel empty? Why do I feel like something's missing? What, what's wrong? Why do I feel stuck and stagnant in life? He says, anybody living like this, man, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. God has something more for you, something better for you, and it's not in these activities. And here's what we know. A lot of these things that he lists are things that we do because we hang out with the wrong people, right? You've done some stupid stuff because of people you hung out with, right? Same here. We, we've done some things we never thought we would do because we were hanging out with the wrong people. How many times have you been hanging out with the wrong people? And look, sorcery, you start practicing witchcraft. Every one of us. <laughs> no, but how many times have you been hanging out with the wrong people and you, and you drank more than you wanted to that night because you were partying, right? How many times have you been hanging out with the wrong people and you got some sexual regrets, some things you wish you could take back, some things you wish you didn't do? I mean, just go through that list. A lot of that comes from us hanging out with the wrong people. And so if we're the kind of people who are saying, we're going to follow Jesus, because we believe a life with Jesus is the best life we can live. Jesus knows the best way for us to live. He created us. He, he, he's the author of life. And so because of that, I want to follow Jesus. His way is better than my way. I've followed my way, and it's gotten me into all sorts of regrets. It's gotten me into all sorts of trouble. So Jesus, I'm going to follow your way. If we're going to do that, then it means that we need to listen to God's word and do what it says. And so because I'm going to live by this, I'm going to refrain from these activities, it may mean that you need to have a conversation with your girlfriend and say, hey, because we're both following Jesus and because I'm responsible to lead in the relationship, I'm responsible to show you God's love in our relationship, we're going to honor one another by pursuing purity because we want to have a relationship that honors God. And so as we're dating, what we're going to do is we're going to save sex for marriage. And in order for us to do that, because you're too hot and I can't control myself, we need to set some boundaries. So we're not going to be alone together. I so want to be alone with you. But I need to lead the way in godliness and purity. So until we get married, we're just not going to be alone together. What it means, because I can't control myself, is we're not going to touch one another in sensual ways. Because I know if I do that, it's going to lead to something else. But I need to step up, rise up, and lead the way in purity. And we're both following Jesus in this relationship, so we're going to set up some boundaries. Because, listen, sexual immorality isn't worth having a decaffeinated relationship filled with regrets. Because we're people of the word, because we say we're going to refrain from these things, it means that if you struggle with watching porn on your phone, that you delete some web browsing apps from your phone so you can't even access it. It means if you watch porn on your computer, you install some software that helps hold you accountable, and it, every time you go to look at something or try to deactivate that software, it sends a notification to a trusted friend of yours so that they can help hold you accountable. 
What it means is that you get some people of the same sex in your life that you can talk with about the desires that you have and they can hold you accountable because you were meant for more than wasting your sexuality away on viewing porn. So you set that stuff up. What it means, if we're going to have a holy shift in our relationships, then it means that we rush to applaud people who are ahead of us. Instead of hating on them, we realize they're not putting my life to hate on, they're putting my life so I can learn from. So I'm not going to be jealous of them. I'm going to learn from them. I'm going to applaud their success instead of tear them down. What it means is that when you have a chance to drop gossip that divides and when wins others to your side, you resolve to speak good and uplift. Instead, you, you decide, I'm going to promote unity instead of division. And if I'm going to talk about people behind their back, the only thing I'm going to say about them is good. So when it, get back, when it gets back to them, they're like, thank you for what you said. Not, hey, I heard so-and-so told me you said. So I'm going to refrain from gossip. What it means, if we're going to be people of the word who refrain from this, when you go out with your friends, you refuse to head out knowing you're going to need an Uber later on that night because you're going to drink too much. You just say, I'm following Jesus. I'm going to set an example for my friends and show them what self-control looks like. Not so I can be self-righteous, but because God has called me for something more than living in drunkenness. And this isn't, i got to follow this list so I could be a good Christian, so I could be a good person. i got to follow this list so God will accept me. Listen, God loves you and accepts you for who you are, but he's called you to something greater. So we say, because we're people of the word, we're going to refrain from this. And look, when you start living out God's word, it'll help you set standards so that you can see, when I'm with my friends, I engage in these activities, but I need to stay away from that, so I need to pick wise friends. My friends are engaging in that, and listen, I'll be friends with you, but I just can't hang out with you like that, because that's going to lead me down a path I don't want to go down. That's going to cause me to compromise my example, and I don't want to do that. Instead, here's how I want to live, Galatians 5.22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Hey, the thing I want in my life is more love. The thing I want in my life is more peace, more patience, more kindness, more gentleness, more self-control. And when I live by God's word, when I say, this is my standard, This is my guide. This is my rule book. Then I'm going to follow this. And I'll see love increase in my life. That's what I want. I'll see peace increase in my life. That's what I want. I'll see patience increase in my life. That's what I want. And as you do these things, watch this. As you're living this out, you'll begin to identify it in other people. And you'll say, oh, I want to be friends with them because that person loves I want to be friends with them because, man, that person shows patience and grace and kindness. As you start to model this in your own life, it'll be easier for you to identify it in other people's lives. And those are the people you want to be around because they're going to help you get better. So if we're going to see a holy shift take place in our life, we just got to say, I'm going to listen to God's word and do what it says. The the second thing we got to do is set boundaries. Boundaries. You know, boundaries create space, right? Um... The guardrail on the side of the road creates a space between my car and the edge of the cliff. Boundaries. The, the red line on the sheet of paper creates a space between the edge of the paper and where I start writing. There's space that's there. Boundaries. You know, e- even God has boundaries, right? G- God has space between him and sin. God can have nothing to do with sin. There's a boundary there. There's space there. You and I, we understand the concept of boundaries because we have personal space. My boundary is if you're close enough that I can punch you, you're too close. Back up, right? And some of y'all know people don't have boundaries because they talk to you real close, close talking. And as they're talking, look, I don't know if you did this, and if I do this, just know what I'm trying to do and respect that, but somebody's close to you talking and you start backing up, but they keep coming closer, right? Have you experienced this? So it's awkward. So so we got to have boundaries, and we understand personal space boundaries, but we're not very good when it comes to setting boundaries in relationships. We're, we're not always that great at setting boundaries in relationships. Listen, here's the definition of healthy personal boundaries. Healthy personal boundaries equals taking responsibility for your emotions and actions while not taking responsibility 
for the emotions and actions of others. Taking responsibility for your emotions and actions while not taking responsibility for the emotions and actions of others. One of the best ways that you can learn boundaries is to say this one word, no. N no. So many of us, so many of us have a hard time saying no. And, and some of us have a hard time hearing no. Right? Dr. Henry Cloud and John Townsend in their book Boundaries uh, included this chart uh, when it comes to uh, how, to, how to say no and, and hear no and how to say yes and, and hear yes. Here, here's what they said. A person who can't say no in the top left corner is a compliant person. This is a person who feels guilt and or controlled by others and they can't set boundaries. I always say yes to everything, right? This is that person, compliant. A person who can't say yes is the non-responsive. This person sets boundaries that don't show care for the needs of others. This person always says no. And it's like, come on, you got some space, you got some margin, you might need to say yes sometimes. And then over here, a person who can't hear no is the controller. Uh, aggressively or manipulatively violates boundaries of others. And then finally, the person who can't hear yes is the avoidant. They set boundaries that mean they don't receive care from others. As you look at this chart, I want to ask you which quadrant you fall into. And... And if you're not sure, ask the person you came with, and they can tell you right away. But we got to be the kind of people who set healthy boundaries, where we can say no, we can hear no, we can say yes, we can hear yes. And so here's what some healthy boundaries may look like for you. Uh, in, in older adults, healthy boundaries lead you to say, hey, we'd love to have you over for Thanksgiving, but we understand that you have your own family now and, and you're busy, and so whatever you choose to do, we support. Healthy boundaries look like this for parents uh, of kids. It means that you know your emotions are not tied to your kid, right? So when he doesn't obey, it doesn't wreck your whole day because you can't take responsibility for his emotions and how he responds. Spouses of an abusive spouse, here's what healthy boundaries look like for you. It means that it's loving for you to report the abuse so that he or she can receive the healthy consequences of their actions and ultimately have the chance for real healing. Healthy boundaries for teens means that you choose friendships that aren't contingent on you compromising or doing stupid things just so you can be accepted by your friends. And then for all people, here's what healthy boundaries look like. One, just one way, healthy boundaries mean you refuse to be jealous about what other people post online. Because you wish your life was like that. No, I got boundaries. That's their life. This is my life. And I'm going to be satisfied with where things are. And if, things, if I'm not satisfied, I'm going to do what it takes to have a holy shift to change things around. So that's relational. Let's talk about money. Um, if we're going to have a, a money shift, here's, here's what we've got to break free from. In 1994, the Wu-Tang Clan told us the philosophy of cream. Cash rules everything around me. Cream, get the money. There you go. Some of y'all heathens know about that. And then in 1997, Puff Daddy came along and he reminded us it's all about the Benjamins, baby. Right? And this is the philosophy that we live by. Cash rules everything around me. It's all about the Benjamins. This is the philosophy we adhere to religiously. So many of our life decisions are informed by money. It's all about money. How can I get more? We're stressed out because we don't have enough money. We get freaked out because we make some money, but then when the bills come, there seems to be barely enough money. We feel defeated when we see how others live, and we wish that we had that kind of money. We rob God because we feel if we gave to him, then it's less money for us, and we need all we can get. And so our culture teaches us, and we buy into the mindset and the philosophy, get as much money as you can. Life is all about money. But here's what Jesus said 2,000 years ago. He gives us a new philosophy. He says, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. 
When polled, the number one thing Americans say they're stressed about more than anything else is money. The seven dwarves in Snow White sang the song, Hi Ho, Hi Ho, it's off to work we go. The average American sings, I O, I O, it's off to work I go. Because I got to make some money and I got to pay the bills. I O, I O, I O, I O. This is the way that we live our life, constantly scratching for a dollar. Here's what Proverbs 22 7 says. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and be enslaved to money. If we're going to have a holy shift when it comes to money, I want to give you a couple things we got to do. First, we have to gain control. We have got to gain control when it comes to money. How do I gain control when it comes to money? Here's what you do. You develop a cash flow plan. And here's the idea. This month, coming up in March, you're going to have some money that's going to flow into your hand. This is your income. Some of you have a variable income, right? And what you do is you say, okay, before the month begins, before March begins, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write how much money I'm going to have flow into my hand. Some of you say, well, well, I don't know because my income is variable. But you know, hey, this month, the least amount I'm going to make is most likely 2000 bucks, 3000 bucks, whatever it is. You write that amount down. So you come up with a plan. I'm going to have this much money flow into my hand. And then what you do is you say, now I'm going to make a plan on how it's going to flow out of my hand. I'm going to tell my money what to do before it does it. So we say, I'm going to have this much money flow into my hand. And then the first 10% of what comes to me, I'm going to give back to God. And I'm going to give back to God because I realize where it all came from. I realize it's flowing from him in the first place, so I'm going to give the first 10% back to him as a reminder that it flowed from him, also because I want to be generous, also because God has called me to do that. So I'm not going to compromise on that. I'm going to flow the first 10% back to him. Then the next percentage, whatever percentage you decide, 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, whatever it is, I'm going to flow back to me in a savings account. I'm going to pay myself. How many of us work so much so that we can pay others, but we never pay ourselves? So not only am I going to have 10% flow back to God, but I'm going to have a certain percentage flow back to me because I work too daggone hard not to enjoy it. So I'm going to save. I'm going to pay myself. And then the rest of it, I'm going to determine where it's going to flow. So I'm going to have $1,400 flow to the mortgage company on this day. I'm going to have $75 flow to Dominion Power on this day. I'm going to have $150 flow to Visa on this day. I'm a, right? You just determine where your money is going to flow. So if we're going to gain control, we sit down before the month begins. We say, here's how much money I got flowing in. Here's where it's going to flow out. We make a plan of where our money is going to flow instead of wondering where it went. This is how we live our lives. The end of the month comes, we're like, I, I made some money, but I don't know where it went. You got to make a plan. The, the second thing, if we're going to gain control of our money, is we got to get out of debt. We got to stop embracing debt. Because again, the proverb writer says this, that the borrower is slave to the lender. He said, I'm not a slave to anybody, but you are. You're a slave to MasterCard. You're a slave to Visa. You're a slave to the dealership for your car payment. You try telling them, I'm not paying you. You'll see the consequences. When we owe money to people, we're enslaved to them. They control us. We got to gain back control. Here's how you gain back control when it comes to debt. You say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm not going to live in debt. I'm not going to owe anybody anymore. And so if I can't pay for it with cash, I can't afford it. I can afford the payments. You can't afford it. You can afford the payments, not it. So you just say, I'm not going to be in debt anymore. And if you're in debt, the way you get out of debt is by following the debt snowball. You can go in the Google machine, type in Dave Ramsey, debt snowball. Don't click on the ads. This isn't a debt consolidation program, but this is a way for you to get out of debt. Essentially what you do is this. You list all of your debts, uh, smallest to largest, and you attack them one at a time. And as you pay off that first debt, you free up some money that you can then pour into the second debt. 
And then once that's paid off, you free up more money that you can put into the next debt and on and on again. And, it, and the payments you're paying for your debts gets larger and larger like a snowball so that you're able to get out of debt within, uh, most people get out of debt anywhere from six months to a year to two years. Able to pay off their student loans and their cars and credit cards and anything like that. So you just say, I'm done with debt, I'm gonna see a life change, and I'm gonna gain control. If you need more help with that, you can always sign up for Financial Peace University. We have that going on um, once a year, and we have a group right now that's in Financial Peace University, and hearing the stories of life change that's taking place in that group is phenomenal. So we just say we're gonna gain control. Here's the other thing we gotta do if we're gonna shift our mindset on money. We have to see money as it's intended to be seen. Here's what money is. Money is a tool entrusted to you by God. Money is a tool entrusted to you by God. Everything we have comes from God. And we have to see money as a tool entrusted by God to us. The average American household income is $63,179. And if we just divide that in half and say, okay, the average American makes $31,500, here's what that means for you. If you make $31,500 or anything above that, here's, here's what that means for you. That you are in the top 1% of the richest people in the world when it comes to income. According to the Global Rich List, if you make $31,500 or more, you're in the top 1% of richest people in the world. Out of 8 billion people, you're in the top 1%. If you make $14,000 a year, you're in the top 10% of richest people in the world when it comes to income. That doesn't sound right, I know. Because when you and I think about rich people, we think about people who have more than we do. Oh, I'm not rich, they're rich. But in the grand scheme of things, compared to the 8 billion people who live on this planet, if you make $14,000 or more, you're in the top 10% of richest people in the world. If you make $31,500 or more, you're in the top 1% of richest people in the world. You gotta get that. You gotta own that, you gotta embrace that. Because if you don't embrace that, you'll miss this. 1 Timothy 6, 17. Teach those who are rich in this world. That's us, that's you, that's me not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Here's what we gotta understand. Everything we have comes from God. That's the mindset. Why does God give it to us? Right here, for our enjoyment. God gave you what you have so you can enjoy it. But it doesn't stop there because if your understanding of money stops there, it's incomplete. He goes on. He says, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they'll be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so they may experience true life. See, you and I, if we're going to have a holy money shift, we got to see money as it was intended to be, which is a tool God has entrusted to us for our enjoyment. Get you some stuff, enjoy some stuff, but also so that we could do good with it, so that we can have an eternal impact with what God has given us. Let me ask you, how did you impact eternity this past week with your money? God has given us what, we've give, what we have also so we can be generous, so that we can give to others. This is one of the reasons why we give back to God through the local church, so that we can have an eternal impact and we could do more good. Because that's what Paul said for Timothy to command to those who are rich in this world, which is you and I. So when it comes to relationships, we have a holy shift. When it comes to money, we have a holy shift. Giving you some practical things to do. But let's talk about work real quick. Work. Work, 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 work. How do we have a holy shift when it comes to our work? See, many of us, when we think about work, when we think about our job, we, we see it like as a necessary evil, right? Like I have to go to work so that I can do the things that I wanna do. I have to go to work so that I can make some money, so that I can live. I have to go to work so that I can provide for my family. And for so many of us, we look at the work we do as a J-O-B, right? It's just a job. 
And so when it's time to clock in, we're there. When it's time to clock out, we're out. That's it. I'm done with work. Thank God it's Friday. I can't wait for the weekend. That's how many of us live our life and how we think about work. But I want to I give you a new, fresh way to look at work. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 says this. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Here's what's fascinating for me. God creates everything, and he says it's good. And he puts this man in this garden, and says he puts him in the garden to work it. This is Genesis chapter 1 and 2. In Genesis chapter 3, as you read the story, this is where Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, rebel against God, and sin enters the world. But before they rebel against God, before the curse, before sin, there's work. In the garden, in paradise, work exists. Work is not a result of sin. Work is not a result of the curse. But many of us treat it like that. Ah, oh, stupid job. But, but, but work is right here before sin ever enters in. And not only do we see work in the Garden of Eden as a gift from God, but we see work somewhere else too. Watch this, Revelation 22, 1. And I don't know if you have this in your Bible, but, but in my Bible there's this headline that says, Eden Restored. And that's just what the, 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 the writers of this version came in and put there so that you can better understand what the section's about. This isn't what the actual writers of the scripture put in. But Eden Restored. Watch this. Then I saw, uh, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. This picture in Revelation is a picture of heaven. And the author says that God's servants will serve him. Do you know who God's servants are? Us. God's servants will serve God. Do you know what serving somebody is? Work. Look, work is in the beginning, in the garden, in paradise, before the curse. Work is in heaven after the curse. Work is not a curse. Work is a gift. But we got to shift our mindset to see our job as a gift. Work is what God has given you so that you can provide. Work is a gift God has given us so that we can use our creativity. Work is a gift God has given us so that we could do good in the world. And for us to see our job as a gift, all it takes, all it takes is a holy shift when it comes to our mindset. Dave Ramsey, who, who I mentioned earlier, um, said this. He said, if you go into our warehouse, and so they sell, sell books on how to get out of, um, how to have financial peace, and they sell all sorts of resources and tools to help people get on track financially. He said, if you go into our warehouse, and you ask the guy who's, who's packing boxes and shipping boxes, hey, what is your job? What do you do? Here's what he's going to tell you. My job is to send hope to people. What's your job? My job is to send hope to people. Wait, but you're packing boxes and shipping them to people. Isn't that your job? You're packing boxes and shipping. No, 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 no. My job is to send people hope. That wakes somebody up in the morning to go to work. What are you going to do today? Send people hope? I want that job. Yeah. Well, but you're just packing boxes and shipping. No, 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 I'm not. I'm sending hope to people. Let me ask you, when you think about your work, when you think about what you do in your job, what are you doing? And if you've boiled it down to just a task, ah, I don't want to wake up for that. That doesn't excite me for the day. Yeah, I'm going to be the person who says, dear God, it's Monday. I don't want to go to work. But when you rebrand what you do, when you relabel it, when you see it with a whole new mindset, oh, no, 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 what I get to do is keep this company organized so that we can provide a service for people that's going to make their lives better. Yeah, but you're an accountant. No, 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 no. 
I help keep this company organized so we can provide a service that's going to make people's lives better. I mean, you just relabel whatever you do and see your work as a gift, not as a curse. And here's the deal. If you don't like what you do, quit. Quit. Go find something you do like to do and get paid for it. Well, nobody will pay me for taking naps. I know. Well, that's tough. You, 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 you got to sort something else out. But if you don't like what you do, quit. And, and, and understand this. Understand this. The job you hate, like there are 10 people lining up, longing to do the thing you do. Right? So just see it. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. When you remind yourself tomorrow that you go into work, hey, I'm about to go in and do something great. It changes everything. Here's the last thing i got to share with you when it comes to work because so many of us are overworked. So many of us just go, 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 go. We never take a break. If we're going to see a holy shift take place in our life when it comes to work, we got to rest. we got to rest. Work is an outlet for your creativity. Work is an outlet for your passion. But if you just go, 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 eventually you're going to get burned out on it. you got to rest so that you can fuel up. Listen, you are better with six days on, one day off, then seven days on. You, you got to take a break, and you got to love a God who commands us to take a break and to take a rest. Genesis 2, verse 2, By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating he had done. Listen, if God Almighty... God all-powerful took a break, you can too. You need to. It's okay. But I got, yeah, don't, don't become a slave to money. Rearrange your life, change some things so that you can take a break. It's no wonder we're so busy, stressed out, anxious, and burned out because so many of us don't rest well. When is your day of rest? Not your day off. When is your day of rest? Jesus said this in Mark 2, 27. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God has given you the gift of work, but he's also given you the gift of a day off so that you can rest and take a break so you can be fueled up and ready for the next week. So, Holy shift. We want to see a holy shift take place in our money, in our relationships, and in our work. Here's the question that I have for you. Out of all the different practical steps I just went over, what one thing in each area are you going to choose to take a step in this week? I want you to write it down. We gave you a note card. We gave you a pen. I want to invite you to write that down. What's one step you're going to take this week Maybe it's, you say, I'm going to sit down and write out the boundaries I need to have. Maybe it's this week that, that you say, okay, you know, March is coming up. I'm going to write out a cash flow plan. I'm going to figure out how much money I got coming in, how much money I got going out, and I'm going to write it down. I'm going to assign my money to go places. Maybe you say, that's it. I'm going, to, I'm going to write out all my debt. I'm going to start there. Then I'm going to follow this plan, this seven-step plan that we have, find out what I want, what are the benefits, what are the roadblocks, what do I need to know? Who do I need? I'm just going to follow that to see a change. What one thing in each area are you going to do? If you're not writing it down now, it's not going to happen. This is your time right now to think about it. Write it down. What's the one thing you're going to do this week to take just one step to see a holy shift? I just want to remind you, we're not changed by the word that we hear. We're changed by the word that we do. The impact of this series will only affect you if you put it into practice. I work too daggone hard to write these sermons for you to not do it. So write it down. What are you going to do? And here's, here's what I know. A month from now, two months from now, six months from now, a year from now, if you do this stuff, you'll come up to me and say, it's the best decision in my life. Some things really changed. I saw a holy shift happen. You don't do this. This series of sermons is going to get archived on our 
podcasts and on our website, and it's going to sit there ineffective. The Word of God only takes action in your life when you take action and do it. So write it down. Take a step this week. What we're going to do is we're going to celebrate communion right now by remembering the sacrifice Jesus made for us. And I love it that Jesus is a God of action. Jesus didn't see the situation we were in and say, well, I hope somebody does something about it. Hope somebody helps them. Maybe they'll get their act together. No, Jesus took action. And he said, I will go and live as a person in their image. I'll live a perfect life, a life they can't live to die the death that they deserve. So I can take away their sin, so I can give them forgiveness, and I can show them just how loved they really are. Thanks so much for listening. We pray God inspires, challenges, and motivates you to become greater through what you've just heard. Again, be sure to check us out at wearetherising.com. Remember, your best days are still ahead.